Last time on the short game. Yeah, it's it's also nice to play on a gamepad because then you're really prepared when you unlock versus mode at the end, <laughs> and you just you just do the Walking Dead fighters, and you you already know all of you all know all the combos, <laughs> super moves. Yeah. You can do the quarter circles. Picking up where we left off last week, here's our conclusion to our discussion of The Walking Dead by Telltale Games with Gary Butterfield of Watch Out for Fireballs. So we've reached the motor inn. And uh, by the way, I just wanted to derail for just a second and ask you guys about the phrase motor inn. Um, like the sign... Sister Christian? <laughs> like is a, you guys want to talk about Sister Christian? Motor for a bit? Um. <laughs> Like, do you guys ever say motor inn? Like, I've always said motel my entire life. And the sign, when you arrive at the quote-unquote motor inn, they all say motor inn every time they reference the place. The sign says motel. It, it, but every character in it says motor inn. It's a, Is it a southern thing? It's not. I'm from Texas. Well, maybe it's other parts of a southern thing, but it's certainly not what you say in Texas. Yeah, hmm. this right here is the first time I've ever said motor inn. Me too. Motorin. <laughs> okay. It's the first time I've ever said motorin. It's not the first time I've ever sang motorin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Anyway, it was just one of those little moments where I was like, what? And particularly, I thought, oh, we must just be a regional thing or something. But then the sign on the place said motel. And I was like, okay, so it's a motel, right? Why are we calling it a motor in? Why is everyone calling it a motor in? <laughs> anyway. You're right. This game sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you, um, if you guys ever seen the movie, uh, the tra- or uh, not Transporter, um, there's a, another Jason Statham movie um, before that. Maybe it's, it's Transporter 1. Oh, I've seen his entire oeuvre. So, uh, I, I think it's, maybe it's the first one. Um, there's a part where uh, they're dealing with people in shipping containers. and But no one ever says, like, no one ever questions. They just say containers. For every time, which is such a general term, it could mean like Tupperware or boxes or anything. <laughs> and they're just like, they're in the containers. How do we get to the containers? They want to know about the containers. And nobody ever clarifies and says, oh, train cars. <laughs> and it's it's really silly. Um, and then w- me and my friend are watching. We looked at the DVD menu and it's like fight in the gr- fight in Greece in the containers <laughs> was one of the chapters. And and then we turned to it and that's literally what it is, is him dumping out a bunch of grease so he can slide around these containers and shoot people. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, all right. <laughs> Like, okay, guys. <laughs> so we're we're in the motor in. We're in the we're in the containers. Uh, and uh, yeah. and and Glenn, who has called us from there, we're expecting him to be barricaded someplace. But actually, he's just sort of camped out there. He's hiding in a in a bucket or something. I mean, what it was a dumpster? And an ice right? box. Yeah, it was like an ice box. Ice thing. He was in a container. And um, sweet callback, bro. And he, he's wanting you to come help him help some woman who's up in one of the motel rooms. I'm just going to go with motel from now on. And uh, I want to say that I'd say of all the puzzles, I kind of consider this a puzzle of all the puzzles in the first chapter of the walking dead. This is the, the best there's this sort of environmental puzzle where we have to get past several zombies in order to go and save this woman or at least get to her door and um, we have to do things like move quietly through a particular area, get certain objects. You have to get a, a, you, basically the only object that it just gives you is a pillow. And so you have a very interesting sort of environmental puzzle that's all about. And an ice pick. Yes. You have to work hard for that ice pick. This is a not a new zombie trope or anything, but sound is kind of the big draw for, for the zombies in this game. They come to any sound. And so... Uh, Carly has a gun, of course, but they are afraid to use it. So the puzzle consists of how do they clear the area of zombies without making any noise? And I th- it was a lot of fun. I think the reason why this puzzle stands out and is good is because it's not arbitrary. Like getting a remote control to work and finding batteries, like those, you know, those could be in dumb other adventure games, but this directly ties into the 
the central thrust and the conflict. Yeah, I, I, it really does. I don't think anybody in a survival situation trying to figure out how to get across a field full of, you know, ravening corpses is going to think, you know, what would really help with this? Some batteries and, and a remote control for a TV. Mm-hmm. But this is a really great example of, OK, what are what do we have on hand? We've got a pillow. Well, I can't exactly smother them to death. How am I going to use this pillow to get past these zombies? And you have to kind of get a little inventive with it. It did get a little weird at one point because a key part of this puzzle is that you have to get a, a spark plug and then you have to know to use the spark plug on a window. And one of the other characters, I think it was Glenn, volunteers the information that, oh, yeah, inside the spark plug is this little what's it that's like turns windows. It's like kryptonite for windows. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and... Um, I, I thought that was a little bit of a leap, but it, it played it off in dialogue to the point where I didn't care. So I thought that was absolutely a standout puzzle and a great example of using sort of your environment. And you know, it, it felt like the kind of problem solving you would have to do in a survival situation and not the kind of problem solving you would have to do in an adventure game. Mm-hmm. So we get across, we kill all the zombies um, by eventually accessing a fire axe. By the way, um, fire axes, do they only exist in zombie movies uh, and other media like fire axes on walls just hanging out there? They're a thing. I've seen I've seen my shit. I don't know if I've ever seen one. It's like we're living in a world where there are no extinguishers. There are only axes randomly hanging on walls. Well, you've obviously never been to a motor inn, <laughs> or else you would know. I don't know why anyone would expect a fireman to carry his or her own axes. With <laughs> they have to have them on site. <laughs> so um, Lee picks up the handy fire axe and uh, uses it to dispatch some zombies and break through this door. Actually, you don't break through the door. You sort of threaten to break through the door. And out comes this woman who... Who tells you that she has been bitten um so this woman that we were trying to save through this entire sort of multi-stage puzzle was already bitten and she sees that you have have a gun and asks you to lend her your gun so that she can finish herself off the entire time she's saying don't come here leave me alone do not rescue me stay away now it would have been very easy for her to say i've been bitten and maybe <laughs> we would have stayed away but she at, to, at least to her credit she is constantly telling everyone not to save mm-hmm. her and so she finally stumbles out and asks for the gun did you guys give her the gun i didn't but she uh she didn't leave it at that of, of course i gave her the gun um, I, I thought that was the only decent thing to do. I, I thought that was a really great moment, though, because it's not a plot choice. You know, it's not she's going to die either way. And, and, and she's not a major character. You're not going to see her again. And you kind of get that. But I thought that it was great that they gave you that moment of choice because it's sort of it's sort of a moment where you get to say a, you get to get to make a big statement about the kind of person that you want your Lee to be. Mm-hmm. So. Once uh, she has shot herself one way or the other, this is what we were we were mentioning. I mentioned Steve, Steam achievements, or uh, in my case, Xbox achievements earlier. And so you'd have this moment where you watch a woman shoot herself, uh, blood everywhere, very very uh, traumatic, dark. They're dark, sad. You know, a great moment for reflection. And then it goes to Duke, <laughs> and it says. <laughs> Steam achievement, and I think it's something to the effect of one shot, one kill. Oh God! Uh, oh and boy! It, and it, for, oh. at least for the Xbox, I, uh. and that may not be exactly what it was, but it, it had that same tone. Oh God! You know f- the f- fuck achievements. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you guys have had the achievement talk on the show before. Oh, uh, we haven't. No, boy, are they? They're bad. oh, they're the worst thing. Yeah. <laughs> they're the worst uh, thing. So I was. Uh, I, I just couldn't help but laugh, and uh, the, which is the exact opposite of what they were going for in that moment. Steam has achievements for these things, but you don't see them pop up on your screen with a little chime each time one happens. Well, this was big and right in the middle, and I just looked it up. It was called It's Just One Bullet. <sighs> oh. So it just goes, Bluetooth. It's just one bullet. Achievement. That's sl- slightly better than one shot, one kill. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but yeah, but this Still is not good. That, this is like, oh, don't worry about it. It was only one bullet. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, player. Yeah. You allowed a death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's gross. Achievements are gross. I I think this is one of those games where they probably would have been better off not incorporating uh, achievements at all. But I don't think Microsoft allows that. Yeah. Yeah, and achievements in this game, uh, I've been looking at them, at least in the first episode, they are not 
achievements for do they're just standard once you've reached a certain point in the game yeah so every everybody got that achievement it's just if you play it on xbox it pops up big and in the middle of the screen yeah th- those are the worst too though it just marks a progress achievements like that just who what are you doing i don't i can't even imagine what the point is to those things those are the worst well they add to your gamer uh sheet or whatever exactly whatever oh, the- sure <laughs> Whatever the Xbox points Which are. is how you represent your worth as a human being, correct? I have mine tattooed to my body. Yeah, that, that's a good goal. It's yeah. a good goal. <laughs> you anonymous pieces of shit. Yeah. Actually, we were talking. <laughs> we were talking about uh, on our, our. We we did a little review of a of a Kotaku article that kind of parroted back everything we love about short games, and and it was talking about a, a, one thing that achievements have shown us is that most people never finish any of their games. Mm-hmm. So we've we've saved slash not saved this horrible bitten uh, suicide case. And um, finally, having completed that, we make it back to the pharmacy where uh, the puzzle involving the remote control was still waiting for us. So we can complete the bit <laughs> with Doug. Um, and finally, that dork shit pays off. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, so you use the axe to break the lock, to grab the brick, to smash the window. You swallow a fly. Perhaps she'll die. Yeah. And... Uh, Doug turns on the TVs, all the zombies go and crowd after it. And one thing we didn't actually mention is that the zombie that has the keys to the pharmacy is Lee's brother. So it's implied, but we don't really we're I mean, we're kind of sure by the time we have to prove to Doug that it's worth going out there. We have to show Doug a photo of the brother to kind of indicate, yes, this is really a guy who worked at the pharmacy, although we don't actively tell Doug. Yeah, it's not implied though. When you mouse, when you put the cursor over, it says Lee's brother, mm. and and when he the the photo you're referring to is a family photo, and he tears himself out of it, so it's totally his brother. Yeah. and he goes out there and has to smash his brother in the face with it, the axe about four or five times. Yeah, not not once. That was that was a really distressing moment. You get there, you kind of talk to your brother's still animated corpse there for a minute. And tell him, you know, I'm sorry I wasn't around, but I'm glad that you were there for mom and dad when they got all zombified and gross. <laughs> That's basically what he said. Yeah. And so that was a really interesting moment because you kind of are it's it's like the only time that that like Lee talks to another person about his actual past. Like it depends on how much you choose to reveal to people like Clementine, but it was a, it was a cool moment as far as the plot was concerned. Yeah, they do um the actually making you do it. And making you actually repeatedly click to smash his face is something that the game does over and over again, um, which is a really kind of great uh, intersection of, of play and, and story, I think, and kind of character yeah. motivation. Um, there's a real, like without spoiling things, there is a master stroke of that in the final episode of this. That is the finest example of that that I've seen, Yeah, I feel like. And it's really, really good. I thought um, it was a great example right at the beginning with the uh, the zombified babysitter. Yeah. Uh, and when I was playing it the first time, that was the, I think, the only time I actually died in the game because I was like, okay, well, I'll click on the zombie once to kill it. And I was like, do I really have to? I don't want to keep bashing. And then it Yeah, ended. both that and uh, you're right, absolutely. I'd say that the most gruesome of the, of the zombie kills of the game was that very first one when Clementine hands you the hammer and watches horrified as you bash the zombie's face in with it and it is really bleak and this one too and it they have a sort of emotional impact that you don't expect a killing of a zombie to have mm. um, and here in particular um, this is something that you cannot progress in the game unless you kill this zombie it's not optional and it's not even something where there's any difference depending you know how you bash this zombie's head with the axe doesn't matter and the game is going to wait for you to finish it could easily have been a cutscene, but making you do it as the player heightens it in a way that i think no cutscene could ever explain right right yeah make make the person do it there's well there's the, that adage that's like movies it's you know don't tell show and games it's do don't show mm-hmm. it, it definitely you know? kind of reminded me of uh our recent episode on brothers tale of two sons where they had you uh, had that elaborate sequence where you had to dig a grave yeah. yeah and then bury your brother in it yeah that was that was yeah. the same kind of yeah the, the end of that is that that game is an amazing like i i i i'm, I'm keep 
I'm hovering around the word Ludo narrative. Yeah, I know, I know. Because it's a douchebag word, but that's what it is. I try not to yeah. use it, but I also feel like it's very uh, it's very useful here. Yeah. yeah, that's what we're talking about is the intersection of play and narrative. And I actually have no idea what that means, so I'm going to assume it means a story about Ludo from uh, yeah from uh, Labyrinth from the Labyrinth. Sarah, yeah. friend, friend down. Yeah, the um, uh, yeah, Ludo just means play. So it's just, yeah, play, play a narrative. So we've got the keys from Bro Zombie. And uh, finally, that enables us to get into the pharmacy and get the pills that we've been trying to get for the last, you know, half of the of the storyline. Uh, but by doing that, we set off an alarm and it's a pretty loud alarm that's heard around the entire area. And as we know, zombies love noise and have started coming down for the dance party and they're all converging on your little uh, your little place there. Uh, but we've also just chopped the lock off the front door. So we're not really safe here anymore. Um, and the zombies are coming. Clem tries to help you out and hands you your dad's cane to block the door with, which I thought was a cool little moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, they are breaking in anyway, and they're breaking in through the windows, and we're given a moment where we have to choose to save either Carly, our hard-boiled you know, reporter lady, or Doug, our slightly nerdy guy who loves his robots. What did you guys choose? I, I chose Carly. Um, I like, you know, I like Carly. I don't know if maybe I didn't do the battery puzzle. The, and that's why, that's why I liked her. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I ended up going with her. It's funny that you bring it up because the, uh, when I was talking about Telltale kind of considering, uh, some of their, their choices as failures just because, you know, they're weighted really heavily. Um, uh, I think they consider, I'm not necessarily saying this, but they consider this to be one of those because they have like kind of cute, young, like sassy reporter girl. Who can clearly take care of herself. She's like... She's also got the gun. She has a gun. And then you just have, like, Chubbs, Chubbs McGut. <laughs> whose great skill is using TV remotes. Yeah, who... Every interaction has been... Everyone just like, oh, this guy. You know, and then they're just like, which one do you like? I actually chose Doug in this one, and I want to tell you why. Uh, I feel I was set up by the game, because earlier in the game, when you choose between Sean and Duck, regardless of what you choose... Duck ends up living and Sean dies. So I'm looking at the situation. Uh, in this one, Carly has a handgun in her hand and she is being grabbed by the leg. And you look at Doug and he has got like three zombies grabbing him. And so I'm thinking uh, a couple of things. First, I'm thinking Carly is a great shot. She's got a gun in her hand. All she has to do is point down and shoot the zombie. Doug needs help. And I'm also thinking, you know, Girls drool and, and boys yeah. rule. <laughs> Bros before hoes. <laughs> Bros before hoes. Um, I'm going to save Doug. And I save Doug and Carly points the gun and the, you know, the classic trope. It goes click out of ammo and she just gets demolished just yeah. immediately. And I, uh. I, you know, I had no point as we talked earlier, did I think about going back and redoing my decision because I, you know, I made my decision. It was what it was, but I I did kind of expect to pick Doug and have Carly live, and that did not happen. I actually, the first time I played through this, I played through this twice, and uh, the first time I played through it, I actually, I actually saved Doug by accident. Um, I was, like, looking away to grab a drink or something. I don't remember exactly what was happening, but suddenly it was that decision moment. It caught me completely off guard. And I think I clicked on Doug just because I was grabbing for my mouse so fast. And I probably wouldn't have saved Doug the first time through, but I'm really glad that I did. I actually think that Doug was a, you know, turned out to be a really interesting character. And what I love about this choice is that you're choosing between these two characters and then you live with this character in this game for a pretty long time. I don't remember exactly how long. Yeah. But this is as far as just gameplay, you know, game content consequences. This may be the biggest choice that you make in act one um you know which character you're going to be spending the next two or three chapters with and i really liked doug but i didn't like him until chapter two or three this time through i chose carly instead and i like her too but i really think it's great how they've um they've made both choices totally viable and it's a real serious consequential choice yeah. Oh, I will say one thing that I, I noticed that was really, did you guys, so those of you who did allow Doug to die, uh, did you notice uh, the sound when he died? No. That was the uh, classic Wilhelm. Oh, I didn't notice that. 
Oh yes, yeah. I think I think man, now that you bring that up, I didn't remember it because I haven't played this in a while, but now I remember that being there and thinking like, oh, that's out of place. Like, th- isn't that the kind of thing where, like, it's kind of a fun Easter egg, but now every time I hear it. Yeah, you can't, I can't not notice it anymore. I just like, oh, some sound guy's really smiling to himself in a bathroom after doing that. Like, <laughs> some guy just gave himself gun fingers in the mirror. Well, the reason that persists is that there are certain people who just achieve orgasm anytime they hear the Wilhelm scream. They mostly go into sound It's, it, it, uh, it's a like a, a branch of ASMR. Yes. <laughs> it's just for the Wilhelm scream, though. Yeah. Uh, so whichever way you go, um, we've saved one of those characters, and then we're all hustling our way out of the pharmacy. Larry... Uh, big jerk Larry knocks Lee out on the way out for no apparent reason. Um, but Kenny, I think, saves him. I think it may depend on exactly how you've been playing the game, but um, it's clear that Larry wanted to leave Lee to die. Uh, Kenny or somebody else uh, saved his butt, and now we've all fled to the motor inn. Motor inn. Mm-hmm. And um, we're getting pretty close to the conclusion of Act One. So we get a lot of denouement at this point. You know, we're at the Motor Inn, which is, uh, as far as we can tell, a reasonably safe place. There are beds, there's a little bit of food, there's some water, there's no longer zombies clawing at an ineffectual gate. And um, we get a moment to have some denouement. Yeah, it's a nice little thing. Glenn says he has to go and get his friends. He can't, he has to move on. And He's got a comic book to be in. And I mean, this is pretty much the the end of it. There is a a real classic joke where they're like, they're standing there, they're like, "Hey, at least there's light. I think everything's gonna be okay." Mm. And then, goosh, all the dun, lights dun. turn off, and that's the end of the end of the chapter. Dun 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 dun. Yeah. And next time <laughs> on, <laughs> I actually love the fact that they have the next time on. That's great. Well, the the next time on is really good too because I like them contrasting because the next episode is all about food. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just like, oh, shit, we're hungry. Like, we have to actually – getting to immediate safety is not really enough and is not that big a deal in this. Like, we actually have to think about our lives long term. And I, I like that a lot. I remember just thinking, oh, like, that's what we're going to deal with next time. That is a very different kind of survival scenario. Yeah, food is the big struggle of the next uh, the next chapter. And chapter two is – a significant improvement on chapter one in many ways. So uh, we won't be talking about it in this episode, but um, if you, uh, uh, yeah, it's awesome. Continue on with the game, gentlemen. Any kind of closing thoughts about the game? I- I'd like to just say, um, ultimately what I found really compelling about this game, although it's a very different thing and it has its you know great strengths uh, compared even to some of the other Walking Dead media, What I liked about this game is the same thing that I like about both the comics and the show, and that is that uh, it's a horror story that focuses on the humanity and that focuses on, like, how are we going to be dealing with kind of long-term goals and, and, like, life in kind of a horrifying world turned upside down. And dramatizes that in a game in a way that I haven't ever seen before. Oh, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of comparisons to be made between this and the very different game, um, uh, The Last of Us. You know, both games about uh, an older guy sort of uh, escort missioning a, a young girl through a horrifying world world full of monsters. But this game, yeah, and I consider that game a masterpiece. But uh, I you think, and I differ you know, somewhat I, on that. We may do an episode. Yeah, on Yeah, we someday. disagree on that. I, I, for me, it was a it was a a great, amazing game. But you know, strip away the things that didn't 100% work about that game, which are some of the kind of shooty, you know, over-the-shoulder combat elements, which, you know, it, it, they were good, but that, that was, to me, kind of the weaker part of the game. Uh, and you have something a lot more like this game. Uh, but without which... any of the choices, you know, with, with essentially zero choice. What I love about this game was that it dramatizes through actual gameplay mechanics, you know, the... You get to choose what kind of person you are, and the kind of person that you are has these wide-reaching consequences in every single dialogue interaction in the game. By the end of, even just by the end of Act 1, I had a a strong feeling that basically everything that any other character was saying to me was affected in some way by choices I had made earlier in the game and the kind of person that I had decided that Lee would be. And that's what just blows me away about this game, playing it the first time and playing it again now, is that the the story the narrative is very very shaped 
by the kind of player that you are. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting uh, comparing those two games, uh, The Last of Us and The Walking Dead, um, which both games I like, you know, I actually like The Last of Us a lot. But when you, if you step back and look at games in general, uh, the reason why The Walking Dead will stay with me longer and I think is more important is because uh, The Last of Us was a great expression of something that we've done a thousand times. Like it is, it is a corridor, you know, shoot some zombies, get a story, shoot some zombies, get a story. There's very little interaction between those two things. Um, the story is really well told. I think that like it's surprisingly dark, mm -hmm. you know, and which I really yeah. liked. Um, I think the story is very good. And the dialogue was good. So, you know, it's 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 on a level, I think, with The Walking Dead in terms of its dialogue writing. As far as like, production and stuff, it is it is a pleasant train ride, you know, and it, it, that's great. Um, but the, the Walking Dead, I feel like, was trying to do something different. Uh, you know, which is somebody who's a big games or art proponent, and that's the thing I'm passionate about. Like, I think that uh, that just gives it, like, makes it really important to me because this was, a, like I said, this was a genre we hadn't really seen before. And uh, yes, there are some kind of stumbling blocks, uh, and it's not as you know pretty as The Last of Us necessarily, and it's not as you know tight. You don't need to hedge that. Like that. It's nowhere it, near as pretty as the, the Last of Us. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, it, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't need to be though. It's it's doing something new, and I'm always going to be interested in something trying kind of blazing a trail. Mm -hmm over something doing something that we know can be done just really, really well. There's value in both, but if I have to choose, I'm going to choose novelty mm -hmm. and advancement. Oh, that's what the short game, that's what short games, I think, are all about, is having is developers having the freedom to experiment without committing the kind of multi-million, billion dollars that it takes to make something like The Last of Us. You know, as innovative as that game, you know, was in some ways at its core, it was a very tried and true formula and uh, seeing something completely new. I don't think you would see uh, from anybody, but a company like Telltale that's doing these tiny, tiny bits of games. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't happen very often. Like the kind of big, you know, big budget, big studio games that are kind of totally new things. You know, I can pretty much count on one finger and it's Dark Souls, you know, Demon <laughs> Souls, like was a really big deal and, you know, felt very new and, and fresh and was a, a big game. But even that was a, kind of a cult hit and it was published by Atlas, which is not, you know, uh, nobody, Atlas doesn't do anything. Um, or for, yeah, from software and then uh, PlayStation published Demon Souls. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, uh, you know, that just doesn't happen very often. And it does happen a lot more in the indie space, which is awesome about you guys doing the short game because, you know, you're going to end up stumbling upon a lot more of that innovation than you would otherwise. Like I looked, you know, before I came on the show, I looked at you guys' backlog and all the games you've done uh, just because I was going into it. And I was going to be like, I wonder if these guys have played Gone Home uh, <laughs> because I was going to ask you about that in relation to this and the uh, and you see that you have. And you guys are stumbling upon these really amazing experiences that are actually people pushing the the medium yeah. and pushing the boundaries of things. And it just happens to correlate with, with length. Mm -hmm. I, I think it does correlate with length. It's not because of the length. I mean, nothing... No, I think it is because of the length because it makes the game... A smaller proposition for the developer and by making it a smaller proposition for the developer like a small game that is digitally delivered and priced at like 20 bucks or, or, or thereabouts is a game that can be more experimental just in the financial prospects of it and by having these games that are you know easy to play easy to make it's also easy to push the innovation and push the genre forward yeah, it's, that's definitely true. There are also, on the other hand, like the single player for most of the big AAA shooters is probably about 10 hours. You know, that's kind of become the standard for a lot of bigger games mm -hmm. as well. Um, but that is definitely true that that kind of caught that barrier to entry does encourage experimentation and that does length is kind of part of that too. It's not, that, I, I guess I'll, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that that's not all of it. Yeah. It's not length. Part of it is also just production value and, uh, and expectation. You know, like if, if you have a minimum number of uh, units you have to sell, you're going to be less likely to experiment. Yeah, it's it's all about financial decisions based on, you know, what has succeeded before. It's it's like the most obvious observation of all time to say we're in the middle of a great explosion of indie games that are doing really cool experimental things. Um, but I feel really fortunate to be playing games at a time when uh, what is actually not a tiny games company like Telltale uh, you know, they're a mid-sized developer. They're no, you know, uh, basement coder uh, can put out something as and based on a, a licensed property can take the risk and put out something as unique as The Walking Dead and have it be a great success. Uh, 
Um, we usually talk quickly about uh, where can people play this game, and I feel like the answer with The Walking Dead is wherever you want. Oh, yeah. This is out on every platform, like every single platform right now, right? Um, uh, you can get The Walking Dead for PC, for Mac, for Linux. I played this on Windows and also on Mac. Um, you can play this game on your PS3, your PS4. It just came out on PS4. Um, you can play it on Xbox 360. I don't recall off the top of my head if it's out on Xbox One, but it wouldn't surprise me. They have iOS versions of it as well, and Android. This is out on every single platform that you could possibly want to play it on, unless... It's even on Ouya. Really? <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so you can play this and uh, Towerfall, and uh, then you can sell your Ouya. Right, who's going to buy that Ouya? The, one of the first times I went to PAX, they were giving out free Ouyas. That is the best way to get a Ouya. Uh, 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 there was straight up a line that I was not willing to wait <laughs> for because I had played the Ouya. Like, it, it, do you want to play cell phone quality games but on your couch? Get an Ouya. Uh, that said, like, uh, I think for me, I I seriously considered it just when I knew that Towerfall was from the Ouya. Mm. <laughs> but yeah. now that it's out on PS4, I'll just buy that. Even though it's like ten times as expensive, I might get the uh, the magazine website I write for. Sometimes um, they might send me a Ouya because they keep uh, having review codes for Ouyas and not enough people have them to actually review these these games that they're getting that they want to review. And I was like, if you just send me an Ouya, I will accept it. I'm not gonna you know return to sender this thing. Reagan, but, get us some Ouyas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the short game, a, a yeah. game, a show about Ouya games. That yeah, <laughs> that people gave yeah. us. Good, good fucking luck, guys. <laughs> you can't do that. That's good. it's going to be real neat. Uh, it's a bit of a sidebar, but actually, uh, uh, Google came out with a console just recently. Um, I forget what it's called. It's like the Nexus Play or something like that. It's a it's essentially Google's answer to the Ouya and also to the Roku. It's a uh, <laughs> thank God Google wants to get into the Ouya game. <laughs> yeah, finally, someone answered that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? We were all waiting, um, and I feel like that uh, being at the same price point at the as the Ouya is the final nail in the poor Ouya coffin because it runs like <laughs> stock android and you know if for some godforsaken reason what you really want is a hundred dollar android console i cannot imagine why today you would buy an ouya anyway uh so we, we can get this game on all these great platforms it's pretty darn cheap it's like 15 bucks right something like that it's it's 20 on steam and there are sales constantly like, it is always five bucks. We're I, approaching fall sale times on Steam, so I'm assuming it's going to be on there. I wouldn't be surprised if they did something for it with Halloween coming up. Now, uh, this will probably... I, I was really kind of bummed when I realized that this episode will probably be hitting our feed post-Halloween, uh, which means that uh, we can't uh, make spooky jokes. So, uh, you know, sadly, you're probably hearing this after Halloween, but the fall sale is probably already going on while you're listening to this episode. Keep an eye for this game and also the second season of Walking Dead also to go on sale and probably also the um, 400 days. Oh yeah, probably also 400 days, which is sort of in between the two seasons. Um, and uh, geez, what's the fable one again? Uh, the Wolf, the Wolf Among, Among Us, Us which um, I'm going to be playing pretty darn soon. I've just not started yeah, it yet. If, if, you're, if you're into this stuff, check it out and also uh, play 400 days if you're into it, especially if you've played season two. So I th think that's about a wrap for us. Uh, thank you so much, Gary, for coming on the show. This has been another real pleasure to have you on and uh, and to actually talk about a game this time rather than just uh, pester you with uh, with inside baseball podcaster questions. That was fun. And this awesome. was fun. And I, ho I hopefully I sound a little bit better now that uh, the that I'm using the correct microphone. Uh, you sounded fine. And hopefully uh, hopefully it'll uh, it'll all go go all right in the editing. And I won't uh, work out in the wash and everything. Um, yeah, happy to do it. You guys are great. This is fun. Um, Let's do it again sometime. Thanks to all of you, all of you dudes, for uh, playing games with me. Yes, indeed. Yeah. You know, you know what you guys should do to make up for your Halloween uh, thing. One, go back and edit in a bunch of Thanksgiving jokes <laughs> into this episode. <laughs> Two, uh, you guys should do Amnesia. Ah, oh, we talked about it. Yeah, it's we on our list. It. You know, I that's a game that I literally started and was too terrified to finish. I need to go back it's, and try it again. <laughs> It's intense. Oh, that sounds great. I don't really care about I don't really care about horror games to be honest. I'll play one if we want to, but that's never been a thing that I've I've really like gotten into. Ah, well, we'll make you do it. I would be curious if if it was effective on you. Um I don't know very much about your gaming taste, but I consider it to be very scary and yeah. in a way that most horror games are not. 
So maybe at the very least you'd find it interesting, if not uh, particularly frightening. Yeah, just the whole horror, everything, movies, games. I, frankly, I just don't generally get scared by them. So maybe I'll give it a shot. Well, you know? actually, that may be an advantage. You'll probably finish it faster because I spend a lot of time trying to decide whether or not to go into the next room. <laughs> There's a lot of dread in that. But yeah, in 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 yeah, and, and wrapping up though, yeah, thank you guys very much for that. Yeah, I really yes. appreciate it. And uh, of course, you can uh, you can catch Gary on his main podcast, Watch Out for Fireballs, as well as a few others on duckfeed.tv. We'll have some links in the show notes. Gary, uh, where can people find you on the internet? Um, you can find me at Duckfeed TV. You can find me at GaryButterfield.net. That's where I put some writing and stuff. And you can find me on Twitter at Gary Bu, G-A-R-Y-B-U-H. All right. And, um, and any particular link you want to share about your uh, album that's uh, coming out? Yeah, it's a duckfeed.tv forward slash store. Um, I really actually, um, will this episode come out before the 21st? I think this episode will probably be out sometime within the next two weeks. The On the 21st, um, if you go to duckfeed.tv forward slash duckstream, we're doing a charity live stream for 24 hours. Oh, nice. Um, 12 hours in Portland, 12 hours in Cincinnati, and all proceeds go to the, the Transactive Gender Center, um, which is a Portland organization that does education and aid for uh, transgendered youth and non-conforming uh, gendered youth. So we're going to be playing games for like a whole day. I'm going to speed run Dark Souls. We're going to do a bunch wow. of Binding of Isaac. It's going to be that great. That sounds phenomenal. Uh, cool. Yeah, that's a good cause. So definitely uh, check that out. Anyone who's listening to this, I would rather have you do that than check out my other shows. And okay. Stuff. Do that instead of buying my record. Give give money to the kids. Yeah, pirate the record. Do that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, I, no, no, don't do that. Um, uh, Nate, where can people find you? Oh, you can follow me on Twitter at NateSTL. Uh, any, uh, oh, and do you want to plug your other podcast? I know things aren't going well. Well, at this point, yeah, it's, and the season's just about done, or the season's done for the Cardinals and the whole thing's almost done. Maybe you can do a, a tearful, uh, a tearful retrospective episode. We were just talking about, um, the sad news from today. We're sad about Oscar Tavares, but, uh, yeah, at Talk About Birds is my other podcast. Gotcha. And Shane, where can people find you? I am at 8 Shane on the Twitters and, uh elsewhere at TBA. So um, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of The Short Game.